Hey folks, you found GSTV. That stands for Good Stuff Television. We celebrate entertainment from the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. You know, the good stuff. And the cool thing about GSTV, you never know what's coming up next. I love the original 1966 Batman TV series. More than any other show, this is the one that, as a kid, I just couldn't wait for it to show up on TV. And of course, as a grown-up, I've gained a new appreciation for the talented individuals involved in this show, especially Adam West. Looking back, I feel like this guy pulled off the impossible. He portrayed the character with such reverence that it allowed kids to admire his heroics, while grown-ups could snicker just a little bit about the general silliness of a grown man dressing up as a bat. And a few years back, when the studios were finally able to work out all of the legal entanglements, well, let's just say it was about time. Finally, fans could get their hands on all of the episodes of this wonderful series. And for me, it has been and will always be about season one. That first season, the ideas felt crisp, the budget was definitely better, and I don't know, maybe I'm crazy. But I can just feel the joy that Adam West and Burt Ward brought to these characters. So much so that now, upon re-watching these episodes, I actually feel a little bit bad about the hostility that I felt towards this show when I was going through my Frank Miller phase in the late 80s. Thank heavens I'm past that now. And now I recognize that Adam West was truly the greatest Batman ever. So what was my favorite episode, you ask? Well, that honor goes to episode 19. The perfect crime! And because all of the stories were broadcast over the course of two days during seasons one and two, I would need to include episode 20 as well. It was called Better Luck Next Time. It always seemed to rhyme. There are a bunch of reasons that these two are my favorites, but the primary one has to go to the best villain ever. Yes, I said it. Best villain ever. To call Catwoman a villain, though, that's nah, actually wrong. As Batman would say, she's just a bit misguided. This was Catwoman's first appearance on the series, and Julie Newmar played her to perfection. Later on, we would get Eartha Kitt's take on the character, and because of a prior commitment, Lee Merriweather replaced Newmar in the movie version of Batman. Both actresses did a fine job of reinterpreting the character, but Newmar nailed it. Her performances throughout the series were some of the most memorable, and she had a lot of company in terms of great villains. In particular, Newmar along with Cesar Romero, Burgess Meredith, and Frank Gorshin, they were the core four villains that would show up time and time again throughout the series run. A little bit of trivia about this episode, the original airing of The Perfect Crime was interrupted by his news bulletin about the near-fatal situation on Gemini 8, as NASA astronauts Neil Armstrong and David Scott were almost killed. ABC was flooded with calls not concerned about the astronauts, but instead angry viewers just, who just couldn't understand why the network had chosen to interrupt Batman. One other interesting piece of trivia is that Catwoman's jumpsuits were designed and sewn by Newmar herself. Wow! multi-talented. Now with all this said, I do have a confession regarding why this is my all-time favorite episode. It's actually because I was able to watch and re-watch an abbreviated 3D version of this episode with my trusty Viewmaster. Not sure how many of you all remember these things, but I loved my Viewmaster growing up. Seven 3D images per reel along with a sentence or two that would move the plot along. That's all you needed back in the late 60s and early 70s. And heck, that's all we had. We didn't have VCRs and things like TiVos and streaming services like Netflix. They were decades away. So if I wanted to watch an episode of Batman, I would have to wait for it to show up on TV and catch it live. And by the mid-70s, eh, you could only catch the show in reruns and syndication. And it would come and go. As time went on, my opportunities to watch the Adam West version of Batman became less and less frequent. But my trusty Viewmaster reels, well, they were always available for repeat viewings. Later on, one year Santa brought me a Viewmaster projector so that I could share my love of Batman and other shows 
with friends and family. It had a high-powered bulb with a metal grate over it, and that thing got very hot, and more than once, I burnt myself with it. These days, toy manufacturers wouldn't let something like this on the market for fear of being sued. But way back then, I just knew that I needed to be careful not to get burned or, heaven forbid, burn down the house. So that's it. Julie Newmar, congratulations. You did it. You helped make your Season 1 appearance more than just a one-time thing. Newmar's Catwoman would return multiple times during Seasons 2 and 3 to vex Batman and Robin. Okay, mostly Batman. If only he could reform her. Much to Robin's chagrin, she would have made the perfect Bat Companion. What do you think? Did you like Adam West Batman TV series? If so, what was your favorite episode? And who was your favorite villain? Let me know in the comments section below. And if you like this video, I'd love a thumbs up. Also, I'd be honored if you'd consider subscribing to my channel. But most importantly, as always, thank you so much for watching. I was walking along, minding my business. When out of an orange-colored sky Slam! Bam! Zowie and wham! Four evil crooks came by I was singing a song Drinking in sunshine Acting as friendly as to be Crunch! Plop! Crackle and pop! They threw their curves at me Somebody yelled, hey, Batman, what are you waiting for? With a zap and a crack, I began my attack. After that, they were flat on the floor. So I'm walking along, carefully watching, in case they should make another try. Zonk, pow, here they are now, out of an orange-colored sky. Crooks, beware I'll pursue every clue that'll lead me to you I'll let you stay, but you must change your way Anytime there's a crime, I'll be there I was walking along, minding my business The love came and hit me in the eye Scoot, scat, just like a bat Out of an orange colored sky I know, I know. I bet you're thinking that the Three Stooges never met Batman. And you know what? You're mostly right. However, if you give me just a few minutes, I'll share with you the very real way that Larry, Moe, and Curly Joe helped Adam West become the best Batman ever. But first, let me introduce myself. Hi folks, my name is Dave Sundstrom, and I like to think of myself as something of a pop culture historian especially when it comes to music, movies, and television. Simply put, I love talking about this stuff. So with that said, let's get rolling. So here's the deal. I don't know how you rank out Adam West when it comes to actors who've played Batman on screen, but I've got to say this feller is my all-time favorite. And when I stumbled across a quote from Adam in the May 2022 issue of Retro Fan Magazine, well, I instantly knew that I was going to make a video about it. If you've never heard of Retro Fan Magazine, well my friends, you are missing out. I'll post a link to that magazine's website in the description field of this video so that you can check it out. Like me, they are all about music, movies, and television from the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. In other words, the good stuff. Anyway, in this issue there's a great article about Mo Howard's final years. Personally, I find this stuff fascinating, and the article delivers a top-notch account of the Three Stooges' cinematic and television efforts during their later years as a comedic team. 
You know, being born in the 60s, the Stooges had already kind of had their heyday long before I became aware of them. In fact, I don't think I've ever seen any of their shorts or movies in the theater. Instead, I became aware of these goofballs through other not-so-obvious ways. Like the Gold Key comic book that they starred in. Man, this mystery girl of Surfer's Beach looks like a great issue. Truthfully, I can think of only one thing that might make it better. Ah, there we go. I don't love all of the episodes from the third season of Batman, but the one where he has to outsurf the Joker is an absolute classic. But I'm jumping the gun here. Let's get back to the Three Stooges. I also remember the Saturday morning cartoons, which I think were better than the comic books because the Three Stooges were more involved. They would film live action bookends for the cartoons, which in many cases were the funniest parts of the show. So I know I'm taking my sweet time getting to the whole Three Stooges Batman connection. But here it is. The final Three Stooges motion picture ever made was released in 1965. In addition to the Three Stooges, the movie, titled The Outlaws is Coming, starred a young actor named Adam West. And you know what? It is a fun film with Adam playing the straight man to all of the Three Stooges hijinks. If you've never seen this movie, which also stars the beautiful Nancy Kovac, someone has posted it for everyone to enjoy right here on YouTube. It's definitely worth a watch. Here's a sneak peek. For the first time, the West's greatest outlaws in one great epic. The Outlaws is coming. Ain't they? And the Stooges is ready. It's the Wild West at its wildest, and the world's biggest nuts at their wackiest, in the wildest shootout that ever fractured the screen. The Outlaws is coming. Isn't they? Getting back to that article in Retrofan, Adam said this about his time working with the Stooges, and this is a direct quote. To come in as a straight man was a real challenge, you know, with their antics, because you have to resist any kind of smirk, any kind of, hey, aren't we funny communication to the audience. So I had to be very seriously involved with their conundrum and their misadventures, and really believe for them to play off me and for them to be funnier than me. It was after making that movie that Adam was cast as the Cape Crusader, and I have to believe that he employed the skills that he developed while working on The Outlaws is Coming, while auditioning for a role that would require him to say the silliest lines with the most sincere and earnest deadpan delivery. Yep, no one, and I mean no one, was ever better at, and again, using Adam's words here, resisting any kind of smirk, any kind of, hey, aren't we funny communication to the audience. That's what made Batman so much fun. The kids enjoyed the adventure of everything going on, and the grown-ups, well, they giggled at how the most silly things were being taken so seriously. And all of that was courtesy of Adam West and the lessons that he learned while working with Larry, Moe, and Curly Joe. Getting back to the Three Stooges, it's been almost 30 years since the last of those nutty and lovable fellers Curly Joe left us. And you know what? Since that time, the world has slowly and steadily just kind of gone to pot. Coincidence? Well, I think not. However, whenever I get feeling a bit down, I fire up one of the old classics. Ah, the fingers in the nose gag. That one is funny every single time. And that Mo Howard was indeed a brave man. Or even better, I can watch the Batman movie that was adapted from the TV series. This incredibly silly scene here is one of my favorites. And again, Adam plays it to perfection. Did you know that actor Lyle Wagner was almost cast as Batman instead of Adam? I've made a video about that. There it is. Go ahead and click on it. I'm pretty much done here anyway. But first, please know that I truly appreciate you taking the time to watch this video. Thanks so much. Lyle Wagoner passed away the other day, and when I read about it, I immediately thought about how he was almost cast as the Caped Crusader way back in the 60s. Yep, Lyle was passed over in favor of Adam West, and while West truly owned the role of Batman way back then, I believe that Wagoner could have definitely given him a run for the money when it came to bringing millionaire socialite Bruce Wayne to life. 
The thing about Lyle is that he certainly looked the part. Watching his screen test with Burt Ward's competitor for the Robin role, Peter Dayell, you can absolutely see why the producers wanted to bring Wagoner in for a screen test. And while I won't ever argue that the wrong choice was made for the Caped Crusader, I do think it is interesting to see Lyle in costume and in cowl. One has to believe that Lyle Wagner was most likely pretty darn excited at the possibility of playing Batman on primetime television, and I'm sure it was extremely disappointing when he didn't get the role. Still, Wagner was never one to wallow in self-pity. Instead, he was the kind of guy who found humor almost everywhere he looked, and that certainly played in his favor when Carol Burnett was putting together the cast for her now legendary comedy show that ran for 11 seasons on CBS. Wagner was part of that show from 1967 to 1974, so maybe he didn't get to be the Cape Crusader, but you know what? The Carol Burnett show ran a whole heck of a lot longer than Batman did, which fizzled out after only three seasons. In her 2010 book, This Time Together, Carol Burnett recalls seeing Wagner for the first time and thinking that he was gorgeous. What surprised her, though, was just how funny he really was. To quote Carol herself, she said, He was incredibly funny. He had a sly tongue-in-cheek delivery that told you he was putting himself on and not taking himself too seriously. In an official statement after Wagner's passing, Burnett said this, He was funny, kind, and multi-talented, but even more than that, a loving friend. I will miss him. Perhaps my favorite memory of Lyle Wagner on television was when he finally did get his own TV show based on a DC comic book character. You know, I really loved that Wonder Woman TV series from the 70s. Linda Carter was great as the title character, and Wagner... Well, he was equally good as the object of her affection. In the 80s, Wagner was frequently a guest star on many of my favorite TV shows, including The Love Boat, Fantasy Island, and Happy Days. I also remember him playing himself on an episode of The Golden Girls in 1990, but that was about it, at least as far as I can remember, because right around that time, he made the decision to retire from the entertainment industry and focus on another business that he dreamt up while working on the Wonder Woman set. You see, Lyle always felt that the trailers that they spent so much time in while filming episodes, well, he felt that they were a bit subpar. And so he started his own company, which rented luxury trailers to the entertainment industry. Yep, Lyle knew exactly what amenities would make entertainers feel a little more at home. And his company, well, it was a big hit. So much for retirement, I guess. Oh well, who needs rest anyway? Not Lyle Wagner, that's for sure. Well, at least until March 17th, when he passed away peacefully in his sleep. He had been battling cancer. Lyle Wagner was 84 years old. Okay, that's all I have. I think I'll end this video with a picture of the Carol Burnett cast reunited a few years back. What a wonderful group of people. And boy, oh boy, they could really make you laugh. All right, please share your memories of Mr. Wagner in the comments section of this video. And if you enjoyed my little trip down memory lane, I would appreciate a thumbs up. That's how I'll know if I should make more videos like this one. Also, I would be honored if you would consider subscribing to my YouTube channel. I talk about music, movies, and television, mostly from the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. You know the good stuff. But most importantly, and as always, Thank you so much for watching. Hello, citizens. I'm taking a holiday from crime fighting in Gotham City. No rest from danger, though, because all around us is that deadly daily danger, traffic. <laughs> I admire the way all you British children triumph over this danger by learning and using the road safety code, like curb drill. Before crossing the road, you stop at the curb, look right, look left, look right again, and then only if the road is clear, walk quickly across. Now children, how does it go? At the curb, stop. Look right, look left, look right again. 
If all is clear, walk quickly across. Remember, be smart, be safe. Always do your curb drill. Holy jailbreaks! Yes, sir! I'll pass that message up. Who was that, Rob? Commissioner Gordon, Batman! The tickler broke out again! And he's taken several prominent citizens as hostages. This looks like a job for the dynamic duo. When you hear the squeal of the Batmobile, look out, it's Batman and Robin. On the trail of another desperate man. When they hear that sound, all the books around, secret hideout. The dastardly fiend always returns here. Look at all those people with pink faces, Batman. You think they've been drinking too much carrot juice, huh? No, Robin. They're being tickled pink. Great Scott! What's that noise? They seem to be moving downwards. Hey, 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 you come on right to the right tickling chamber. Even as I speak, you're heading towards the dreaded tickling chamber. Oh, no! Oh, yes! I can see the headlines now! Batman and Robin tickled them back! Looks like the end, old chum. Don't worry, Robin. There's something here in my utility belt that just might save our capes. When you hear the squeal of the Batmobile, look out, it's Batman and Robin. On the trail of another desperate man. When they hear that sound, all the books around, chamber. Holy buckshot! What are you throwing, Batman? Simple pepper, Robin. It's the only thing the tickler's vulnerable to. I'm hurling it into the ventilation system. It can only be a matter of moments before... <laughs> the <laughs> Let's get Let's get these citizens untied out of here. But, Batman, the tickler's getting away. Don't worry, Boy Wonder. He may have tickled his way out of jail, but he's going to sneeze himself right back in. Holy pepper pot, Batman, you've done it again. Yes. When you hear the squeal of the Batmobile, the Batmobile. Hey, folks, you found GSTV. That stands for Good Stuff Television. We celebrate entertainment from the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. You know, the good stuff. And the cool thing about GSTV, you never know what's coming up next. Okay, I've got to admit that the summers of my youth, well, they were spent watching a lot of television. And one of my absolute favorite shows was Batman, starring Adam West, Burt Ward, and this guy, Alan Napier, as Batman's loyal butler and faithful friend, Alfred Pennyworth. And when we weren't watching TV, me and my friends could often be found running around the neighborhood pretending to be superheroes. Fortunately for me, in addition to the homemade Batman cape my mom made me, I also had my Batman Halloween costume ready to go. Unfortunately for me, for whatever reason, maybe it was because it seemed like I was everybody's third best friend. Yep, we actually ranked them out way back then. I was not often given the opportunity to be everyone's first choice. Instead, 
it would seem that more often than not, I got to be this guy, good old Alfred the butler. I would get to do exciting things like pretend to answer the bat phone, usher Master Bruce and his ward away from Aunt Harriet, and maybe, just maybe if I was lucky, I could hang out a bit with pretend Batman and pretend Robin in our pretend bat cave while we figured out what to do next. Quite frankly, I would have preferred to have been the villain, but that was most often relegated to another kid a little higher on the friendship chart. By the way, this dynamic played out in a similar fashion when we played Star Trek. Yeah, guess who got to be Chief Engineer Montgomery Scott? Speaking of Star Trek, have you ever noticed that in 99% of the scenes with Scotty on that show, James Doohan's right hand is semi-obscured by his other hand, or even more frequently an object? It turns out he was missing a finger. I don't know the story behind when, where, or how it happened, but it does seem like with a little research, that might make for an interesting video somewhere down the road. But let's get back to Alfred. It turns out that he was a pretty cool feller, and quite frankly, there were a ton of things that I learned by watching and emulating Alan Napier's version of the character. Napier himself has said that when he was approached about joining the Batman TV show, he knew nothing about the character of Alfred. He'd never read a Batman comic book, but he was keenly interested in the promise of steady work, and the money seemed to be pretty decent, so he jumped at the idea. In fact, he was the first person cast for the show. And of course, the rest is television history. Sure, on many an occasion, Alfred could be found in the Batcave serving light snacks to our weary heroes. But during that amazing TV show, and yes, it was a wonderful, astonishing, and simply amazing television program to a young man of my age, Alfred? Well, he got to battle supervillains like the Joker. Somewhere during the third season, he even got a smooch from Batgirl. Lucky, lucky man. And wouldn't you know it, he even found himself donning the cape and the cowl, fooling all of Gotham, helping to conceal Bruce Wayne's true identity. Yes, Alfred became the Batman. And as I got older, I realized that I'd learned quite a bit by watching Alan Napier on the tiny screen. His Alfred taught me the value of lifting and supporting others. His Alfred taught me that loyalty and kindness were traits that should be highly prized. And his Alfred taught me that regardless of who people think you are, where they try to place you in the pecking order of life, you can be more, way more. You can even drive the freaking Batmobile. Chew on that one for a moment, my friends. Yet Mr. Pennyworth actually found himself behind the driver's seat of the world's greatest vehicle. Sorry, kid. And if that ain't enough proof that you can be whoever, whatever you want to be, well, I don't know what is. And it would seem that Hollywood has realized the same thing as well. The show Pennyworth, currently on Epics, tells the backstory of a young Alfred Pennyworth. And let me just say that it is a very different version of the man who will eventually become the Wayne family's most trusted ally. It is a completely different take on good old Alfred, patterned more after the Michael Caine version and other versions of our favorite butler than Mr. Napier's. It's a dangerous and extremely violent world that this Alfred operates in. But it's also an extremely interesting, albeit very mature, take on the character. Getting back to Alan Napier, it's worth pointing out that his career was a lengthy one. For most of it, he was a character actor in both movies and television. He did, however, prior to Batman, take front and center as Sherlock Holmes in a televised version of Doyle's Legendary Sleuth. If you're interested in learning more about this very dignified and very resilient actor, you might want to check out his autobiography that was released posthumously just a few years ago. So that's it. One more picture. Again, Alfred's right there in the thick of things. If I remember correctly, that golden truck can only mean that the nefarious King Tut is on the loose once again. Anyway, please share your memories in the comments section. While you're at it, I would love a thumbs up if you enjoyed this video, and I would be absolutely honored if you would consider subscribing to my little channel. I talk about music, movies, and television, mostly from the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. You know, the good stuff. But most importantly, and as always, thank you so much for watching.
Say hello to Alan Napier, Alfred. Yes, Alan Napier. Alan, Alan had a very significant role on the show, but it, you were standing in one position for most of that series, it seemed. Is that about right? No, absolutely not. <laughs> I'm sorry to spoil your story, but it's not true. Well, I think whatever you would say is probably probably right. Then I've been I'm wrong, and and so how right. how can I argue with an English butler? I, I can't. I can't. <laughs> Everything you say sounds so dignified. Well, you see, I, I can explain the English accent that Alfred really is illegitimate. Oh, he is. Yes. <laughs> He's the illegitimate son of Lord Sidcup. Oh. <laughs> oh, we should we should not talk about this on television. This is something that should go in a diary. Oh, oh well then, I'll pass it off and say that he was sent to school, one of those yeah. only English schools that go to that. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much, Alan Napier, George Barris, Yvonne Craig. Thank you so much, Eartha Kitt, Julie Newmar, Adam West, Burt Ward, and Frank Gorshin. Thank you very much. Tomorrow night, the Playboy, Playmate of the Year, India Allen, and music from Mr. Mister. Thank you all, folks, and we'll see you tomorrow night. A ticking bomb means trouble for Batman and Robin. Holy breaking and entering. It's Batgirl. Quick, Batgirl. Untie us before it's too late. It's already too late. I've worked for you a long time, and I'm paid less than Robin. Same job, same employer means equal pay for men and women. No time for jokes, Batgirl. It's no joke. It's the federal equal pay law. Holy act of Congress! If you're not getting equal pay, contact the Wage and Hour Division, U.S. Department of Labor. It's time to test your trivia knowledge. But before we get started, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel. And most importantly, after you've finished, please share your score in the comments section of this video. Alright, are you ready? Let's get going. What is Batman's true identity on the show? Is it Bruce Wayne, Clark Kent, Dick Grayson, or James Gordon? The correct answer is Bruce Wayne. Question 2. Which iconic villain did not appear on the television show? Catwoman, The Joker, Penguin, or Two-Face? The correct answer is Two-Face. Question 3. What was the name of the villain played by Cesar Romero? The Joker, Mr. Freeze, Penguin, or The Riddler? The correct answer is the Joker. Question 4. What character was added to the show during its final season? Alfred, Batgirl, Green Hornet, or Superman? The correct answer is Batgirl. Question number 5. So how did Batman and Robin change into their costumes? Did they do it in the Batmobile, in a phone booth, sliding down the bat poles, or twirling around? Of course, the correct answer is sliding down the bat poles. To the bat poles, Robin! Question number six. Which actress did not appear as Catwoman in the television show or in the movie? Eartha Kitt, Joan Collins, Julie Newmar, or Lee Marriott? Joan Collins did not appear in either the TV show or the movie. Question 7. How many seasons did Batman run for? 3, 4, 5, or 6? And the correct answer is 3. The show debuted in 66 and ended in 68. Question number 8. Who was the first villain to appear on the television show? Was it Bookworm, Egghead, Penguin, or The Riddler? Frank Gorshin's The Riddler was the first villain to appear on the TV show. Question 9. 
What is the name of Dick Grayson's aunt on the television show? Is it Barbara, Gertrude, Harriet, or Martha? And the correct answer is Aunt Harriet. One final question, number 10. Which of these bat vehicles did not appear on the television show? The bat boat, the bat cycle, the bat jet, or the Batmobile? The bat jet did not appear on the show. How did you do? Don't forget to share your score in the comments section. And if you're up for the challenge, here's another fun trivia video for you to match your wits against. Thank you so much for playing, and regardless of your score, you are awesome. Now you can be Batman in your very own Batmobile by Mark. Comes complete with back tape. No batteries needed, ever. Just back up to wind the powerful spring motor. Set the brake. Release and... Holy blast off! Away you go! In your very own Batmobile by Mark. Hey folks, you found GSTV. That stands for Good Stuff Television. We celebrate entertainment from the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. You know, the good stuff. And the cool thing about GSTV, you never know what's coming up next. Here are a few of my favorite podcasts that you can watch right here on YouTube. Ike Eisenman from Disney's Escape to Witch Mountain series and author Jonathan Rosen take an affectionate look back at pop culture from yesteryear. They share memories, have great, great discussions, and conduct interviews with people who were involved in some of the most beloved classics from the past. They even asked me to join them a couple of weeks ago, and I had a great time visiting with these fellers. Look for that episode to debut in a couple of weeks. What's a glitter boom girl? Well, I'm not sure, but I sure do love their podcast. Authors Amy Asbury and Robbie Ann McPherson take an affectionate, loving deep dive into 70s and 80s nostalgia, revisiting everything from childhood toys, teen idols, TV shows, and even TV dinners. Yep, all the stuff that made the 70s and 80s so darn special. Over the past handful of years, the Bat Cave podcast has taken a look at each and every episode of the 60s Batman TV series. Host John S. Drew celebrates the great and looks to see where the show went wrong as it slid into oblivion during its third and final season. These days, John is also reviewing episodes of the animated series as well as shows like Electra Woman and Dyna Girl. And every week, I like to jump on the BK Escape pod. That's a podcast version of BK on the Air, which airs live every Saturday from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern Time. But you know what? BK stands for Barry King, and this guy knows his stuff. And the podcast, if you listen to it on YouTube, he intersperses it with all sorts of fun retro nostalgia audio clips. And if you've been watching any of the videos on my channel lately, you know that I've been listening to the Real Brady Bros podcast. The Real Brady Bros are Barry Williams and Christopher Knight, and they have a great time visiting and recapping iconic Brady Bunch episodes every week. Good stuff. Folks, I'll drop the link to all of these podcasts in the description section of this live stream. I would definitely recommend checking out some or all of these podcasts. They are so good, each and every one of them. And if you find yourself enjoying one of them, well, click on that subscribe button. That's how you'll know when a new episode is published to YouTube. All right, now back to more retro TV programming.
Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. 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 You've got to hand it to Burt Ward. He really was the perfect boy wonder. And did you know that there was a time early in his career that this guy would routinely go head to head, fist to fist with the legendary Bruce Lee? More on that in just a moment, but first let me introduce myself. Hi folks, my name is Dave Sundstrom and I like to think of myself as something of a pop culture historian, especially when it comes to music, movies, and television. Simply put, I love talking about this stuff. So with that said, let's get rolling. So when I was a kid, I was a pretty big fan of Bruce Lee, but not for the reason you might think. You see, I loved Bruce as Cato on the short-lived television series, The Green Hornet, which was primarily because The Green Hornet was a spin-off from one of my all-time favorite TV shows, Batman. And yes, the two crime-fighting teams did clash during a couple of episodes, which led to a face-off between Cato and the Boy Wonder. Now, most folks might think that Burt would be a bit intimidated by going mano a mano with Bruce Lee, even if it was pretend, but he wasn't. You know why? That's because Burt was no slouch either when it came to the martial arts. He may not have been Bruce Lee, but then again, Burt was a full black belt in karate. And another little known fact is that when Burt and Bruce fought each other on screen, they'd already sparred against each other in real life. This information comes from a recent article by Showbiz Cheat Sheet where Burt acknowledges that both he and Bruce lived in the same Hollywood apartment complex for a time and because of their common interest in martial arts, they became friends. In fact, not only was Burt a friend of Bruce's, but he got to know the entire Lee family, including Bruce's son Brandon, who was just an infant at the time. So maybe it's just me, but the thing that I found most interesting about these legendary sparring sessions between the Boy Wonder and Bruce Lee was what would happen afterward. According to Burt, he and Bruce would go pick up the rest of the Lee family and head to Chinatown for some amazing Asian cuisine. Nope, it wasn't what happened on the mat that was the most memorable for Burt. It was the time spent with Bruce, getting to know the man and his family. Of course, all this was before Bruce became a big-time movie star. It was before Bruce's first leading role in a motion picture. The Big Boss had even hit U.S. theater screens. And a year after that, Bruce would be on fire with the classic kung fu movie, Fist of Fury. Sadly, on July 20th, 1973, Bruce Lee was found unconscious in his Hong Kong hotel and rushed to a nearby hospital, where he died later that day. Bruce had been experiencing painful headaches and had taken some medicine to help dull the pain. Whether it was an allergic reaction to those painkillers or as many believe a cerebral edema caused by overexertion and heat stroke, the fact remains that the legendary Kung Fu master was gone. On a much lighter note, can I just say that I love this TV show so darn much. As I look back on the series that made Bert a star, I feel nothing but joy and a strong sense of appreciation for everyone involved. And I have really enjoyed following Burt's career. Thankfully, most of his work, aside from a few direct-to-video B-movies, have been related to Batman. But that's the way it should be. What once appeared to be typecasting has now become something that continues to provide a livelihood for Burt. Worth mentioning are the two recent animated Batman movies featuring the late Adam West and Burt's voice work. If you haven't seen these two films, well, you've got some homework to do. They are so much fun. Plus, you've got the always lovely Julie Newmar providing the voice of Catwoman as well. And while brief, I've got to say that Burt's fairly recent appearance on the CW miniseries Crisis on Infinite Earths as an older Dick Grayson was terrific fun to see. However, the stuff that is truly most important to Burt has nothing to do with costumes, superheroes, and supervillains. These days, Burt spends much of his time off-screen working with his wife Tracy in a non-profit group they started called Gentle Giants Rescue. In addition to caring for a multitude of shelter dogs, Burt and his amazing wife have been working on a specialized diet for dogs that has allowed many owners to actually double the lifespan of their beloved pets. All right, one last picture. Gosh, those two sure made a great team. Now it's your turn. 
Please share your memories in the comments section. And while you're at it, I'd love a thumbs up if you enjoyed this video, and I'd be honored if you would consider subscribing to my channel. I talk about music, movies, and mostly TV from the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. You know the good stuff. But most importantly, and as always, thank you so much for watching. Hey folks, you found GSTV. That stands for Good Stuff Television. We celebrate entertainment from the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. You know, the good stuff. And the cool thing about GSTV, you never know what's coming up next. Holy shit, give it! Batman! Adam West! Hello, Christmas kids, how are you? Hi, can you do it? Well, you can have two or three of them if you want. All right, here's a real autograph. There you are. Thank you. It's a great pleasure. Thanks, Batman. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Can I help you, sir? Uh, yes, I'd like to return some things, please. <laughs> I'll return it. It, it. it isn't even Christmas yet. What did you do? Meet him halfway up the chimney? <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. All right, what is it? Well, there's some uh, gray leotards and a matching monogram top and a robin's egg blue cape. Oh, shall I credit your account, or would your wife like a smaller size? <laughs> no, they aren't for my wife. Uh, you see, I'm not married. Oh, no, you're not? No. Ooh. <laughs> and it's one of those ballerina jobs, is it? I guess why it pinches under the arm, does it? Hey? No, you can uh, forget the ballerina. That's not exactly the image. I know they're not Big Mac coveralls, but these are my work clothes. Work clothes? You must be with the CIA. No wonder there's a credibility gap. Like, a what? A credibility gap. I'll get it. <laughs> you know, you guys are really over-escalating. I'll call the manager. Oh, please, please. That's not necessary, sir. Oh. Well, look, may I ask, have you tried our junior miss shop? <laughs> <laughs> look, look, you, you've got to help me. I can't imagine. <laughs> Now, I, I don't, I, I don't really wear this outfit all the time. Just when I go out during the day, I'm Bruce Wayne. Bruce who? Bruce Wayne, millionaire philanthropist. <laughs> well, nice to meet you. <laughs> it's nice to meet you. I'd like to say that I'm Granny Goose and I'm a broken cookie. A br <laughs> you better burn these. You better burn these, Mac, before Alan Funk catches up with you. I can't tell you who I really am, because if I do, I'm in trouble. You'd better believe it, Bruce B. <laughs> look, look, I fight crime in this outfit. No wonder crime isn't making it. <laughs> oh, haven't you ever heard of the bat pole? Cool it, cool it, no Polish jokes. <laughs> <laughs> Have you heard of the bat phone? Oh, don't tell me, please. Do not tell me. You have a princess bat phone, right? No, 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 it's, no, it's all right. All right, you win. Uh, I just happen to be Batman. I'd like to think so, sir. But you must admit you're a little puny to pass for the magnificent caped crusader. That paragon of virtue and snappy dresser. Tell you what, why don't we exchange the leotards from some wild blue fishnets? <laughs> You know, you talk very strangely. You know, I, I, I just like my refund. Now, I only need one outfit, and I'm wearing Please, it under I'll, my suit. I'll take your word for it. Your secret, sir, is safe with me. Thanks to me, you'll sleep more safely tonight. I hope so. Thanks for saying that, because I'd hate to think that there were gollywogs out there. <laughs> Well, I can't do that tonight. Can we help you fight the Joker? No, but I could have used your help with that weirdo floor walker. Hey, I've got an idea. Come on over here and sit down with me. Mary Francis, you sit here. Harry, where's Nathaniel? Come on up here, sweetheart. All right. Th you see, kids, this is not a night for fighting evil. This is a night for singing. Here's a song I'll bet your daddy taught you when you were little kids. This old man, he played one. He played knick-knack on my drum with a knick-knack. Give a dog a bone. This old man came rolling home. All right, Mary Francis, here's a rhyme for you to make. 
This old man, he played too. He played knick-knack on my shoe. Beautiful. You did it. She's terrific. With a knick-knack, panty-whack, here's a dog of bones. This old man came rolling home. All right, Nathaniel. You ready? Yes. All right. This old man, he played three. He played knick-knack on my knee. You know I couldn't have done that without him. With a knick-knack, panty-whack, give a dog a bone. This old man came rolling home. Harry, my boy, here's one for you. This old man, he played four. He played knick-knack on my door. It's a stroke of genius. With the knick back, fatty whack, give it out the boat. This old man came rolling home. All right, kids, here's one I'm sure you're never going to get. It's tough. This old man, he played 348. <laughs> He played knick-knack on a great big piece of Christmas cake. <laughs> Holy Cole Porter, he didn't. <laughs> With a knick-knack, fatty whack, give the dog a bone. This old man came rolling home. <laughs> Phone call for Bruce Wayne. Oh, this sounds important. Excuse me, Nathaniel. Pardon me, kid. <clears throat> yes, Commissioner. Great Scrooge. Is that villain on the loose again? <laughs> right, Commissioner. I'm on my way. Oh, come on, Batman. Sing us another Christmas song. Oh, I'm sorry, kids. I can't. You see, crime never takes a holiday. <laughs> Hey, folks, you found GSTV. That stands for Good Stuff Television. We celebrate entertainment from the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. You know, the good stuff. And the cool thing about GSTV, you never know what's coming up next. There it is, in all of its glory, the bat nipple. Yep, when the movie Batman and Robin debuted in 1997, this was one of the things that just bugged me the most. Every time I saw it on screen, I cursed Joel Schumacher's name. But you know what? After all these years, I've realized that I was gravely mistaken. More on that in just a moment, but first, let me introduce myself. My name is Dave Sundstrom, and I like to think that I am something of a pop culture historian. At least when it comes to music, movies, and especially TV. Simply put, I love talking about this stuff. Alright, with that said, let's get rolling. You know, a lot of folks like to blame director Joel Schumacher for the origination of the bat nipple, but that's just not true. The reality is that we can go back to the original Batman TV series. That is where we will see the very first bat nipple. So in season three, episode 10, in an episode titled Surf's Up, Joker's Under, one of my favorites, by the way, the Joker plans to become the king of surfing and hopes that his fame will give him control over the hearts and minds of the citizens of Gotham City. This episode is so crazy, so much fun. And I'm not sure what the conditions for filming were that day, but if you take a look at Adam West here as Batman, you will see. There you go, right there, bat nipples. Yep, without a doubt, we all owe Joel a huge apology. I didn't need molded plastic to improve my physique. Pure West. Holy cow, Batman, what's that? One of the other things that I love about this episode is the nod to the 1966 feature film where Batman does battle with a shark. And just like in that classic movie, Batman has in his utility belt shark repellent. This time, however, all that's necessary is just a little spritz. That's all it took. In his book, Back to the Batcave, Adam West has said that this is perhaps his least favorite episode, calling it a real low point in the show's history. And while I agree that season three overall wasn't great, 
I absolutely love this episode. And this feller running up the beach right now, the great Cesar Romero, he's a huge part of the reason why I love this and every single episode of the classic Batman TV series that the Joker is in. Look at the glee. Look at the fun. Look at the joy. If you ask me, he was the ultimate Joker. Way better than this. This. Or even this. One more thing. Did you know that whenever there was a scene in a villain's secret hideout, the cameras would be tilted at an angle? This effect, also used in comic books, helped convey a feeling that the villain was crooked and that evil was afoot. Hey, speaking of villainy, Catwoman is another one of my favorites from that classic TV series, and I've got an entire video dedicated to the feline felon, and in particular an episode titled The Perfect Crime. If you'd like to join me on another trip down memory lane, I'll post a link to that video at the end of this one. So that's it, at least for today. Did you love the old Batman TV series starring Adam West and Burt Ward as much as I did? If so, please share your memories in the comments section. And if you enjoyed this video, I would appreciate a thumbs up. Maybe even consider subscribing to the channel. I talk about music, movies, and mostly television from the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. You know, the good stuff. But most importantly, and as always, thank you so much for watching. Take a look at the Batcave. Here we go. Is that nice? <laughs> Isn't that nice? Now, you're, I know that you are Batman fans. How many of you actually watched the series when it was on? All right. Okay. Well, this is perfect. This is just perfect because, and this is for you people at home, I want you to just follow along with me, take this little bat quiz, see if you remember some of these things, and you can score at home. First of all, I want you to play along here. <laughs> when Batman's uniform caused uncomfortable chafing, what did he do to relieve that discomfort? Did he, A, scratch the itch, B, change uniforms, or C, crawl along the floor in a disgusting manner? Let's check your guess. Oh, you got it right. You guys got it right. Okay, here's another one. Question two. Question two. They're doing very well so far. All right, Batman's favorite way to impress Batgirl was to A, send her flowers, B, take her to dinner, or C, perform cheap Indian rope tricks. Okay, well, let's see if you got that one right. Lucy. Okay. All right, you're two for two. All right, see about this one. Some of you are doing pretty well. All right, Batgirl loved it when Batman would A, talk on the bat phone, B, take her for a ride in the Batmobile. Or C, delicately manicure her nails. C. C. Let's take a look. <laughs> yeah, that was too easy. That was too easy. That was. Too... All right, here's here's the last one of the quiz. Yeah. All right, here's the last one of the quiz. What does Robin do when he has the mansion all to himself? Uh, now think carefully about this. Does he a study? Does he B, does he practice the piano? Or C, does he party with five screaming babes? C. Okay, score for yourself. <laughs> Michelle Pfeiffer? <laughs> the only true cat woman is Julie Newmar, Lee Merriweather, or Eartha Kitt. And I didn't need molded plastic to improve my physique. Pure West.